Welcome back to part two. This is the Valhalla Games podcast, and this is part two in our historical special about the Battle of Premisoli Bridge in Sicily, World War Two. Dan, the uh, the Volksjagger have a bit of a reputation, and so do the British Airborne. You may have something that you could recite for us that uh, will give us a bit of an insight into their psyche and uh, their culture. Go. The Ten Commandments of the German Volksjagger. One, you are the chosen ones of the German army. You shall seek combat and train yourselves to endure any manner of test. To you, battle shall be the fulfilment. Two, cultivate true comradeship, for by the aid of your comrades you will conquer or die. Three, beware of talking, be not corruptible. Men act while women chatter. Chatter may bring you to the grave. Four, be calm and prudent, strong and resolute. Valour and an enthusiasm of an offensive spirit will cause you to prevail in the attack. 5. The most precious thing in the presence of the foe is ammunition. He who fires uselessly merely to reassure himself is a man of straw who merits not the title of Falschemjäger. 6. Never surrender. To you death or victory must be a point of honour. 7. You can triumph only if your weapons are good. See to it that you submit yourself to this law. First thy weapon, then thyself. 8. You must grasp the full purpose of every enterprise, so that if your leader is killed, you can fulfil it yourself. 9. Against an open foe, fight with chivalry, but to a guerrilla, extend no quarter. 10. Keep your eyes wide open. Tune yourself to the utmost pitch. Be nimble as a greyhound, tough as leather, hard as Krupp steel. You shall be the German warrior incarnate. Field Marshal Montgomery said this of the British Airborne. What manner of men are these that wear the Maroon Beret? They are firstly all volunteers and are toughened by hard physical training. As a result, they have that infectious optimism, the offensive eagerness which comes from physical well-being. They have jumped from the air, and by doing so have conquered fear. Their duty lies in the van of the battle. They are proud of this honour. They have the highest standards in all things, whether it be skill in battle, or smartness in the execution of all peacetime duties. They are, in fact, men apart, every man an emperor. So we've already heard that the 1st Airborne Brigade had received the the information, or the the signal, Marston tonight, and the party was on. The operation first was all go. So at twenty hundred hours, one hundred thirty three parachute air- aircraft and eleven tug and glider combos had assembled off the coast. The How African many coast. parachute aircraft? One hundred and thirty three. That is a massive amount of planes, isn't it? At that, that stage of the war, it was the largest uh, airborne operation the Allies had mounted. Wow. Okay, go on. Sorry. So they assembled at their RV off the North African coast because they'd taken off from various different airfields. From there, they followed the plan. So the plan was head uh, head east northeast um, and go around the right hand tip of the corner of the island of Malta. As they rounded that, they were on schedule and everything was going to plan. Now what they had to do is they had to fly for approximately two and a half and three and a half, two and a half to three and a half hours in total, dependent on winds, to where they were uh, paralleling the coast, the Sicilian coast. They were to stay 10 miles off the coast to stay away from friendly shipping. This is to avoid any friendly fire incidents. So they would handrail the coast up. The coast would be on the left-hand side. And when they reached the uh, Sumito River, which happens to be, of course, the river that the Primasoli Bridge is on, they would turn left and head inland, and only a couple of kilometres inland would be the Primasoli Bridge and their drop zones. And all this is by night. All this is by moonlight and... Correct. Navigation navigation by land, would it be? Uh, what we can see? Navigation by, by basically um, bearings and minutes, so on and so forth. 
getting around their initial checkpoint of the island of Malta was no problem because I believe Malta had a very um, recognisable six massive searchlights which had um, went up into the air and the uh, the forces on Malta were expecting it them to arrive and that they were illuminated. The reason for that, of course, is all the airborne attacks that um, Malta had been resisting throughout the, uh, the, the war in the Mediterranean. Airborne attacks from the Germans. That they uh, and so they didn't want to be mistaken for a German airborne attack and get shot out of the sky before they even got to um, got to Sicily. Funny you should mention that, Rex, because okay. all went well. All right, go on. All went well with their plan until they reached near the Sicilian coast. So as the massive flotilla arrived near the coast, 33 aircraft uh, came within the 10 mile exclusion zone and flew over the Allied fleet offshore. Now, the Allied fleet itself was on standby because it had been warned of an imminent Luftwaffe raid that evening, just immediately prior to the Allies' air flotilla flying over the top of them. What happened then is the gunners, the anti-aircraft gunners on the fleet, opened up on the Allied air armada. Now, instantly aircraft were hit. Multiple aircraft then collided um, as they were taking evasive maneuvers from the flak. Some crashed into the sea, some were badly damaged and had to turn back to Africa. Some of these planes are full of airborne men that would then no longer take part in the operation. Um, some planes are so badly hit by flak they had to turn back and they had heavy casualties inside. Some inexperienced pilots in the 51st wing nerve broke. One squadron uh, was ordered to turn back at the very first barrage of flak by their squadron commander, full of airborne troops bound for the operation. Now, what happened then, of course, is the friendly forces opening up on the Allied planes alerted the Axis forces that were on the shore that something was happening. All they did is merely sit there and watch as the Allies shot their own planes out of the air. And once they were clear of the obliging Allied fleet, who had saved the Axis forces valuable ammunition, the Axis forces then opened up. As they'd already been illuminated, and it could clearly be seen that it was in fact not Axis planes, but Allied planes, and it was a blue-on-blue -blue fire. So planes are now at erratic heights, avoiding the fire. The Dakotas themselves hadn't been fit with uh, self-sealing tanks, fuel tanks, and they were packed with ammunition. So what happened was, when the fuel or ammunition on board was hit, the whole thing went up. Planes are flying into each other, and planes had severely dropped or gained height and broken formation. And of course, with their navigational skills, those that were trying desperately to continue with the operation had lost their lead navigational aircraft in many cases and were wildly off course. It's all just going terribly wrong, isn't it? Yep. Paratroopers recount that uh, in one plane, the uh, loadmaster, the American loadmaster, was so inexperienced, didn't know what was happening, that he put on a flak jacket and a, and a helmet and grabbed his Tommy gun and started firing out the door because he thought they were being attacked by other aircraft. The paratroopers themselves in the back, of course, being so close to the drop zones, were already stood up and hooked up, ready to jump. At this stage, they were yelling and screaming for the pilots and the aircrew to get them anywhere near the drop zones. The pilots themselves were yelling back. They didn't know where they were and they were going to be turning back. But all the paratroopers needed to do was to clear the water so they could jump. They didn't care. Anywhere in Sicily would do. Just please get them there. They knew how important each and every one of the men was to get above the drop zone. Now, in amongst all the confusion, there were some real stories of valor as well. For instance, uh, Dakota number 83, each one was numbered, was hit clean in its ammo containers that it was carrying and burst into flames. The American pilot threw four paratroopers that were probably dead out under their parachutes and then two wounded paras out the plane as well before jumping himself and the plane went down. There's a famous story of uh, Colonel Pearson, one parachute battalion's commander, um, who had been asleep and then as he prepared to stand up and hook up, 
noticed that the plane had, uh, that he was in started doing a massive U-turn and heading around. When he headed forward past the Lodi into the air crew compartment to find out what was going on, he found the co-pilot sobbing into his hands, completely broken, as a flak exploded around them. And the pilot turned to him and yelled, I'm not willing to go any further. Pearson let out a thunderous roar and exclaimed a swear word, pulled his sidearm and stuck it at the co-pilot's head and said, well, I'm not prepared to go back. So unless you carry on, I'm going to shoot him and then I'm going to shoot you as well. And by the way, if you think I'm bluffing, I've got a pilot back there that can fly this plane better than you. Now, for a long time after I heard that in the parachute regiment, I thought he must have been bluffing, but it was only recently I read a book and it turned out that actually in Pearson's plane, one of the paratroopers was an ex-RAF pilot, well capable of flying the plane, that had been court-martialed and sent to the parachute regiment for dangerous flying earlier in the war. So Pearson was not bluffing. So that's a handy guy to have on board for sure. That's a shocking, that's a shocking situation, isn't it? That's uh, that's something like Hollywood's mo- Hollywood movies are made of for sure. Yeah. It gets worse. Now, the planes, of course, uh, for the operation, you fly at treetop level um, to avoid radar and such such like. Now, the planes then were meant to climb to jump height, which are around 600 feet, and reduce speed so the parachutes have the best chance of opening safely. Paratroopers were less affected by the wind, and, of course, they had the right amount of time to hit the ground, which was a balance between time spent in the air and therefore a target suspended under a canopy and um, uh, being lower to avoid the sort of winds that sort of come in about 800 to 1,000 feet typically and the further you are up in the air the more affected you are and more spread out you're going to be on a jump. That's very low isn't it? That's uh, like you compare that to a a skydiver today uh, like a commercial skydiver what um, that seems very low. Yeah, so typically in uh, the airborne these days, um, and I've jumped with many armies, uh, you jump at about 800 feet um, once you're a trained parachutist. The reality is is that uh, your your parachute is designed to open earlier than that. In particular, a lot of the parachutes in the world today, and I know the, uh, the British low-level parachute, you can jump much, much lower than that. Um, of course, at the time, uh, the paratroopers of the 1st Airborne Brigade did not have reserve parachutes either. Um, the British Army did not have parachutes, reserve parachutes, until after the Second World War. So if you shoot at an open, um, well, probably jumping at that height, maybe by the time you sort out your uh, your problem with your primary chute, there might not be time, time to open the second chute anyway, but if you haven't got one, that's kind of irrelevant. Yeah, so at parachute training school, and every time you go for a jump, the... Uh, the, the PJIs like to joke, if your parachute doesn't open, bring it back and we'll give you another one. Right. Okay, so uh, let me just recap. It's Bedlam. It's everyone's worst nightmare. We're all hanging around off the coast, ready to ditch in the river, in the in the sea. Um, and uh, the guys are trying to get uh, ashore somewhere, even near the uh, near the drop zone, or if not even just over dry land so they can get out of the plane and take part in the action. Is yeah, that that's about right. it? That's right. They're taking casualties. The uh, The summary is this. Um, due to the frantic actions of the pilots, many planes are now miles and miles off course. They're flying too fast. They're flying too low. Remember, Sicily is an immensely mountainous country as well. So their altimeters are set to mean sea level and they haven't factored in the fact that there's mountainous terrain. They're taking vast amounts of enemy fire. And the green lights are now on for the paratroopers to jump. So, at the intended DZs as well, the Falschmeg had initially held their fire because they were expecting their own paratrooper reinforcements to be dropped in that night. However, once all the flak had been uh, it sent up in the air, they started expecting it might be their own men. They sent up signal flares. The signal flares then started to pick up the coloured parachutes of the British Airborne, which the Germans didn't have. Once they realised they were British, they manned their weapons, stood to, and began firing themselves at the low-flying aircraft from excellent positions on top of the Johnny positions. 
Now, of the starting 133 aircraft, only 33, sorry, 39 dropped their paratroop cargo on or within half a mile of their intended drop zones. 48 more dropped them more than one and a half miles away. And many of them dropped up to 20 miles away from the drop zones. 17 of the planes returned to base the troops on board and 12 of them were unable to find or, or, or drop men over DZs at all. Plus 11 paratrooper aircraft were shot down. When the paratroops hit the ground, less than 20% of the brigade were dropped according to the plan and 30% through no fault of their own were never even dropped at all on Sicily. When they formed up on the ground, Little did they know, because they were in penny packets, but only 12 officers and 283 other ranks were on the ground to fight as intended, which is a third of a battalion out of a reinforced brigade. On the plane's return to the base, a top brass saw what state the operation was in, judging by the return of the aircraft all they could do was hope the offensive spirit of the airborne men was going to be enough to somehow achieve the, the mission and hold the bridge. Unfortunately, they'd already lost communications due to the lack of material that had arrived with them. So the paratroopers were cut off, they had no communications, and at this stage all they could do was hope that by blindly following their plan, the reinforcements are going to get to them. Sound familiar? It does. Cut off behind enemy lines, scattered to the four corners of the compass, um, injuries, and very little material. Situation normal. Yep. All you need now is lunatics laughing at you from the woods, and it'll be like another thing over a year later. Yeah. So, yep. back to the bridge. As a result of the drop, 1st Battalion were tasked with assaulting the bridge and then holding it, had been wildly dispersed all over the landing zones in Sicily. Three para had descended even worse. Okay, both the artillery forward observation officers for the operation had failed to land. Uh, and one was on a plane that had to return to base. The brigade was to draw naval gunfire support from the Royal Navy, which had anchored off the coast, only a few kilometres away. And in so doing, they had uh, naval bombardment detachment officers, one of which landed, and he became the only forward observation officer that the, the brigade had at all. His name was Captain Vera Hodge. Eventually on landing, he managed to find his way to where men of Frost's 2nd Battalion were RVing on the ground, and he banded himself with them. The gliders came with a second wave, and... Unfortunately, they bore the brunt of the Falschmager enemy fire for reasons we spoke about earlier. Yeah, they're on full alert now. Nobody's uh, nobody's sleeping anymore or uh, or uh, relaxing. They know what's coming. So um, those big uh, those big slow planes, they're going to get it. That's right. Uh, having to circle and then coming in, having to circle, losing height the whole time, and then coming in continuously corkscrewing down. Uh, they were sitting ducks. Luckily, uh, of the few gliders that made it in, of the 11, four of them made it, and three of them contained the six-pounder anti-tank guns. And a complete fluke. One of them even landed immediately on their objective. They came in so close to the bridge, they clipped the bridge as they landed, and landed only 90 metres away. And their gun and the tow jeep was completely intact as the men clambered out and quickly started to chop at the glider to get it out. That's uh, that's a pretty good success. That's what you call parallel parking. Yeah. So the, the Brit Paris are starting to RV uh, under the withering fire from the side of positions, including the Falschmjäger machine gun battalion. The uh, They described it as a massive lights, tracer fire, smoke and fire. The uh, The... The beacons were actually haystacks which had been lit again by the Falschmjäger because they believed that was their own planes advancing. So all around them, as uh, instead of being able to get to rendezvous points which are marked by uh, by lights of different colours, 
men found they couldn't identify anything because there was many different lights all over the, the, uh, the drop zones. Now, of course, men were struggling to find their equipment containers as well. Uh, many of them that had the leg bags had them ripped off them because the planes, they were drop, dropped them at too, too fast a speed and they were ripped off them as they reached down to the slipstream. The heavy equipment containers are wildly scattered. Um, so most men were, and most battalions and units were completely devoid of any heavy, uh, heavy weapons. And most of the battalion units, such as um, mortars, had no mortars. And uh, I think only one Vickers machine gun actually made it on the operation to the bridge. At the bridge itself, Captain Rand from the 1st Battalion managed to round up about 50 men from 1 para and 3 para. He knew that the coup de main was uh, needed to continue, so he uh, get, got close to the bridge, got his bearings. Uh, on getting to the bridge, he sent out a second in command to do a quick reconnaissance. While he was away, he split the groups into three groups, the assault group, the um, cover fire group, and the reinforcement group. Um, old terms, but that's the way he was going to run it. When the, uh, when the recce party came back and reported that the bridge was still being held by the enemy, the assault went in. Rain led the assault group, and they quickly assaulted uh, with a massive yell and shout of Wahoo Muhammad, the regiment's battle cry. They uh, charged forward into the northern end of the bridge, charged at the bunkers, screaming and yelling and throwing gammon bombs and putting a withering weight of fire on the Italians there. The Italians, not knowing what at all had hit them and the size of the force, immediately surrendered on taking casualties. So Rand quickly gained stock of what he needed to do and using his airborne initiative realised that he'd got to keep the momentum going. Immediately, instead of calling for the uh, covering fire group to come in and the reinforcement group to move through him, as was his plan, he continued immediately, sprinted across the bridge with his assault group and assaulted the pillbox positions on the southern side of the bridge as well, with the same result, a massive uh, casualties and then surrender by the Italians holding that. He called in his cover fire group and then the reinforcement group, who quickly came in and held both ends of the bridge and Primasoli Bridge was in British airborne hands. Wow, so that's a pretty good effort, uh, considering everything's happened so far. So uh, that's the end of the story then, a complete success. We wish. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking there might be more to this story than, uh, than that. Yeah, so they've already got massive gains because simply the airborne way, moving hard, fast and aggressive has achieved the aim. But now they had to decide how to consolidate. The first thing they had is, of course, they got massive amounts of Italian ca uh, prisoners. So they promptly routed them up. Um, about 70 or so, and took them to the farm buildings at the northern end of the bridge, the Casta Stefano. Other para groups, of course, started arriving in dribs and drabs because there's nothing like attracting paratroops to an RV like the sound of a good firefight. The men could immediately, um, uh, uh, I guess, find out where they were and then head towards the bridge to, to RV there. So that's just after midnight. At around 3 a.m., Brigadier Lathbury and other paras had rounded up arrived at the bridge uh, where they also encountered Lieutenant Colonel Frost leading his men south towards the Johnny objectives. The second parachute battalion was actually in the best shape. It had had a tailwind all the way from Africa and it had actually arrived 20 minutes over the uh, landing zones before even the coup de main planes arrived there which was supposed to be the first. As such, the German Fallschirmjäger still thought they were friendly, fire, uh, friendly planes and hadn't opened fire on them. Um, in so doing, the 2nd Battalion had the most uh, manpower out of anyone and they were in fairly good shape. Uh, unfortunately, they'd still been lost uh, men to the scattering all over the Sicilian countryside and casualties sustained in the drop and Frost himself had landed in a ditch and uh, almost broken his leg. Now, as Lathbury approached the bridge an ambush was sprung. It turned out that an Italian convoy had approached the bridge unsuspectingly, uh, even though the gunfire was going on everywhere. And it was a bridge, it was a convoy full of trucks and also a towed artillery piece. The paras let them come right onto the bridge in their killing area and then opened fire. Um, Lathbury, hearing the fire and then hearing it die down, thought it had finished, but as he got close, he actually uh, became wounded because of a throw in an Italian hand grenade where the last Italians were holding out. Uh, he got shrapnel in his back and in his thighs, and he'd had to hand over brigade command to Colonel Pearson as he, uh, as he was treated. 
the parachute engineers luckily that most of them had landed on site and immediately they started stripping the explosives charges and uh, the wiring off the bridge so that the, the Germans couldn't demolish it Colonel Pearson when he found out what was going on uh, asked them how long it would take to strip it down they said one hour he told them immediately to get to it and then he asked them how long it would take the Germans to wire it again and they said because of the size of the bridge it was going to take around four hours to rewire it and Pearson and Lathbury both factored that in because they knew that if the worst came to worst and they had to relent or they got pushed off the bridge they would have an additional four hours before the Germans could wire it sufficiently to blow in which they could mount a counterattack or hopefully they could be reinforced by their um, supposed armoured reinforcements as they came up to them. Now we spoke about the second battalion as they reached the Johnny positions they went into forming up points They'd already planned this attack, of course, but of course they were split across the countryside. Men got into ad hoc groups. And so doing, they assaulted up Johnny 1 to start with. And as they reached towards the top, they laid into a classic manoeuvre of having a fire support group to the front, then outflanking the bunkers and the wire to launch desperate assaults onto the bunkers, which they then captured. They also captured a number of prisoners um, from Italian positions within the caves that we discussed earlier also. When they reached the top of this position, they then continued up the other Johnny positions as well, and they found that on each objective, the story was the same. Uh, in so doing, men earned many gallantry medals, and uh, the Johnny positions themselves are now in the hands of the 2nd Parachute Battalion, and they occupied the high ground looking over the bridge. So we're in pretty good shape at this point. Yeah. So by using Airborne Initiative, they'd managed to regain some of the lost initiative. One has to remember that there's still a vast amount of fire going on um, from some positions they simply hadn't been briefed about. Um, you know, there's a lot more positions and a lot more volume of fire coming, and they, initially they, they wonder what's happened here because they'd captured the main positions which they had been told about in their intelligence. So who were these other guys out there shooting at them? So at this point, they're not, um, they haven't uh, encountered the Fokshamaga? No. The Germans are on the front foot here because they knew who they were facing. The British, on the other hand, thought they were facing stiff resistance from an unknown enemy, and they didn't yet know who it was. And probably expected that it was more uh, more Italians, and um, their success with the Italians to this point's been been pretty comprehensive. So, um, yeah, they they probably they're probably starting to feel they're probably starting to relax a little bit, maybe thinking that uh, thinking that the worst of it might be over. Yeah. Now, the one thing that the Brits have got on their side is that the um, the wide scattering of the troops, the, the massive. I guess break up of the formations led even the Fallschirmjäger who were used to disciplined formations of aircraft to believe that there were many more formations flying over than they actually were. They actually became confused about what the potential um, drop zones were and what the objectives for the, the British Airborne was and they simply thought there must be many more uh, men on the ground than there was based on the number of planes that had gone overhead. Of course they couldn't see where they discharged their airborne troops and little did they know that many of them hadn't discharged them until later or discharged them further than the, than the drop zones away. So they were unknown about the quantity of uh, British airborne they were facing on the battlefield and they were um, a bit reserved on this and they chose not to immediately move into assault on the British airborne positions, on the Johnny positions or at the bridge until first light when they could do a reconnaissance. Yeah, so in that way, the um, the breakup of the plane formations as they were coming over the coast um, helped them to some degree, whereas if they'd been uh, tightly packed and uh, all landed exactly where they were meant to, they'd be uh, they'd be in one single position. The Fulcher Mega may have uh, may have decided to take action earlier before they'd taken the bridge, and they may have found that uh, you know they had. Uh, Troops coming in from the flank and the rear while they were trying to uh, trying to assault the bridge, and uh, it would have been a lot tougher than it was. Yep, the winds of war were very fortunate for the airborne that the Germans decided to be prudent in this manner. Really, really fortunate. Now, from the top of the par of the Johnny features, Second Parachute Battalion could see in the distance towards Catania that columns of trucks with Fallschirmjäger were advancing down the road on Highway 114 towards the bridge. 
Unfortunately and frustratingly, they were devoid of heavy weapons after the drop, and two power were unable to bring fire to bear uh, because they could see Falschmjager forming up for attacks in the valley below their positions as well. Out of reach of their heaviest weapons, which were at this case um, Bren guns. So what they've got is they're com holding a commanding position for visibility, but they cannot bring any fire because the weapons simply don't have the range. Hmm. What time in the morning is this we're talking about now? Uh, we're just starting to get light. So the, the German yeah, right. Falschmag are forming up down for an attack down in the valleys at around 0630. And being the middle of summer, it was already light at this stage. Also, unfortunately... Even the basic small arms, the MG-34s and 42s of the Falschmager, outgun uh, for distance the even the Vickers MMG by a couple of hundred metres. So you can see now that uh, they hold a commanding view, but they were very much like spectators in a grandstand. What happened next was the Falschmager decided to launch their assault after they'd done a reconnaissance, as we spoke about. They opened up the massive mortar barrage and massed machine gun fire onto the Johnny Heights. Uh, and they basically forced the Paris down into the hard soil where they were still desperately trying to dig in with only their entrenching tools into the hard soil. Most of the Paris did not have dug in positions. Even though we spoke about the Italian pre prepared positions, some of them had been destroyed in the Paris attack, and many of them did not, could not simply take the volume of, uh, of men that the 2nd Parish Battalion had, plus their attachments on top of the Johnny features. They were desperately trying to dig down with anything they could. And uh, it was not a rocky hill in the fact that there was large boulders strewn around. It was simply a case of the rocks being in the ground so you couldn't dig down. So they were desperately trying to get down to get out of the, um, the fragmentation from the, uh, the mortars and also the um, mass machine gun fire. Hmm, bit of a nightmare. All that, uh, all that shrapnel flying around and uh, nowhere to go. Yep. The Falschmager got closer and closer and finally they come within small arms fire range of the British Airborne. They started eventually to start finding the range and picking off the odd Falschmager, but they were being battle-hardened veterans. They were using cover to their best advantage and getting closer and closer to the British positions. What had also happened is because of the uh, white phosphorus rounds that the, uh, and the smoke that the Germans are firing and also Tracer and the MMGs, uh, sorry, the machine gun ammunition that both sides were using, that now set fire to the undergrowth leading up the Johnny features too. And what had happened was, due to the wind direction as well, the smoke had created a massive smoke screen that was blowing back into the paratrooper's face so the German advance was smoke screened from them and they got closer and closer under the smoke screen. The men, as they could hear the Germans coming closer and start to see them through the smoke, began to fix bayonets because they knew that the close quarters fight was on. Now, as the assaulting Germans come within range, one Bren gunner, Corporal Neville, caught a German MG team starting to come into action within his arcs of fire. He opened fire and uh, wounded both the men, who then lay in the open, uh, wounded and crying for help in German. Because the undergrowth had caught fire, Cool. Neville noticed that the uh, fire was getting closer and closer to these Germans who, can't, who couldn't move and they're going to be burned to life. So he handed his Bren gun to one of his mates to continue firing at the advancing uh, threat of enemy soldiers and ran out and dragged the two Falschmäger into his trench one by one to save them. And later on those Falschmäger were Kazavaked down to the medical dressing station which is at the bottom of the Johnny features and they treated both the Allies and the Germans equally, sorry, the Axis equally, and did a fantastic job throughout the fight of keeping people alive. It was only when the Germans got back there that finally the men of the Airborne could see the uniforms and work out who they were fighting against. And it was their old rivals from Africa, the Falschmjäger. Wow, that's uh, that's an interesting story. That's a that, that's a movie waiting to be made. So can I just clarify then? So these uh, so the guys are on the Johnny, and and we talked about it uh, a little bit before about how there was there's a situational, a, a very simple situational map up on uh, uh, the Valhalla Games website, so you can get a bit of a perspective on what's going on here. But looking at uh, at the map up on the website, you've got um, the Johnny positions, and these Falschmäger are coming in from the south at this point. 
Uh, basically, the Fulsham Jaeger are in positions all around the uh, the Johnny features. That entrench themselves. Uh, they were on top of Johnny Two, um, and they were around Johnny Two, looking north as well. But then the uh, Fulsham Jaeger machine gun battalion, in particular, under uh, an officer called Laon. I'm not too sure how his name's pronounced, but he was further to the south. So the machine gun positions, a lot of them were further to the south, and their battalion uh, was from assaulting from that direction, yes. So we know that the uh, there's a uh, convoy of uh, trucks coming in from the north that are going to be approaching the bridge and getting there soon, only in a matter of time. Um, we've got Falschermaker coming in from the south, and um, presumably the southwest a little bit as well. Um, so they're starting the, the, the British are starting to get the squeeze now, aren't they? Yeah, they are. As the Falschmeager started to come up into the uh, into the British positions on the Johnny features, um, desperate hand to hand fighting happened. The uh, the men had nowhere else to go but basically fight it out, and it was hand to hand combat and close assault, um, trench by trench. As each of the British airborne positions became overrun, they'd fall back to the next trench back and the next trench back and the next trench back, trying to create a, uh, a mobile defence perimeter um, so they could hold on to the features. They knew that they couldn't afford to be pushed off. Now, they're completely devoid of any heavy weapons at the 2nd Battalion's position. But what they do have is the only forward observation officer that the brigade has left with them. So, Captain Veer Hodge at this stage desperately managed to establish comms, finally, uh, with HMS Newfoundland, which was off the coast. The Paris had been giving him um, a non-stop stream of coordinates of German FUPs, uh, machine gun posts, what they thought were command positions, etc., as well as uh, um, basically coordinates for their final fire on to break up attacks within their own perimeter themselves. So Vera Hodge managed to finally get through and get hold of Newfoundland and gave his first fire missions. So the first six inch rounds from HMS Newfoundland landed well behind the Falschmeager lines as they advanced because Hodge of course had been reserved in his initial fire and he then began to walk them on to the advancing Falschmeager from behind, eventually catching the advancing Falschmeager in the open. And the screams and the explosions could be heard all over the, the valley as the Falschmeager were uh, caught and cut to ribbons by six inch guns. And one has to remember you, you don't want to get hit by a caliber of a weapon that's measured in inches. Yeah, that's uh, that's significant HE. That that's um, that's a that's a, a big weapon. There's a lot of uh, a lot of explosive in a weapon that size, and those little uh, little strips of steels are just uh, cut you to bits. I guess um, it sounds like a pretty horrific uh, horrific sort of thing. And if you're up and if you're down in a uh, in a trench position, you're you know in a in a blockhouse or something like that, you've got a large measure of protection. But if you're uh, if you're like they are, and you're trying to move forward. And uh, all of a sudden, all you've had it's up to this point is uh, a Bren gun and uh, you know, some light, some some uh, some other light arms. And then now all of a sudden you're getting some really massive uh, massive ordnance coming down on you. It's going to ruin your day, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And across the valley on Johnny Two, where the um, Falschmeier had set up plenty of machine gun positions, they were firing with complete impunity um, at a, from great heights onto the Johnny positions, you know, as well. And they had not had any return fire so far. So what uh, Vera Hodge did was, once he'd broken up the attacks on their position, he turned the naval gunfire support onto Johnny Two, and uh, completely hammered the Falschmeier positions there as well. In so doing, he bought the uh, the second battalion and their attachments some time. They then spent the time to regroup, um, dig back in, sort their casualties out, get into the medical dressing station, um, and, and counted as that as well. Was Axis wounded too? Uh, both sides treated the medical their wounded very very fairly throughout this battle. Great chivalry, and they went back to digging in. Now in this lull, uh, there was a Captain Panther. Uh, of 2nd Battalion, and he went down into the dead ground between Johnny 1 and 2, 
and he had with him by chance a bunch of mortarmen from the second parachute battalion. Now the mortarmen had lost all their mortars on the jump. They did not have any mortars and they were fighting as um, as just plain infantrymen. When they went down to this valley, what they found is a group, an entire battery of abandoned Italian four-inch light howitzers. Now one can only imagine the glee of what had just until that moment had been impotent mortarmen missing their indirect fire when they found four-inch howitzers that they could then use with a store of ammunition and their excitement to exact vengeance upon the enemy. I don't want to. I don't want to burst the bubble on your uh, on your historical tale here, but I'm I'm just I'm just envisaging playing this. You know, I'm just envisaging playing this as a game. If you get to position A, you will get all of these indirect fire weapons. Yeah. If you don't, you won't. What a what a game changer. Yeah, it's it's great, and we'll talk about maybe how why this flicks my switch later too, because I'm loving that it's you're enjoying it. No, hopefully, it's doing it for the, for the listeners out there too. Now, so we've got a bunch of mortarmen who had just with glee found a way to exact their vengeance upon the enemy, and they had been cross trained on weapons too, so they had the ability to use these. Now, of course, what they can see from the top of the Johnny positions and call down to these men. Uh, and give fire missions was they could then see on the northern side of the bridge a Folschemjäger, bunch of Folschemjäger trucks packed with paratroopers coming down Highway 114. So, the mortarmen with the howitzers started to range in on the German targets. North side of the ridge, they got 15 rounds off. And then, satisfied with the damage they'd done, started turning them on to uh, the Johnny 2 positions as the Folschemjäger thought they'd managed to catch a breath there after the naval gunfire support had caught them out. They got hit again by the, uh, the paratroopers with the Italian howitzers. Um, eventually, though, they had to cease fire because the uh, caliber of the large weapons that was carrying out counter-battery fire against them was much greater than their own range that attracted the fire of the German 88s that were in positions uh, the north side of the bridge. Um, it was much more, they were receiving much more than they could dish out and they had to uh, cease fire because the uh, men around them were getting a little bit unhappy, they were drawing so much heat. Yeah, right, okay. But uh, still a good break, a very, very good break. Yep. That's right. Now, there was a natural lull in the battle as all this happened after that final last uh, artillery barrage. Both sides gathered and consolidated their defences and uh, treated their wounded and uh, basically did battle prep for the next phase. But back at the bridge, what happened was, because there was no established comms between the bridge and the uh, paras on the Johnny positions, they had heard a massive cacophony, cacophony of warfare that had massive barrages and now it had all gone silent. And all they could assume was that the small force of paratroopers that had held there had been wiped out or had been captured. So the men at the bridge, not knowing their fate, assumed the worst. And as German Falschmäger started to approach down Highway 114, they uh, cocked their weapons and fixed bayonets and vowed to exact vengeance upon them. Now, at 10.30 in the morning, the message clearly hadn't got through uh, who held the bridge because a lone German motorcyclist came roaring down the motorway towards the bridge, was caught in an ambush, uh, which missed him, but certainly gave him the warning that it was not Axis forces holding the bridge, and he promptly did the fastest U-turn in the world and sped off back to Catania to Stangenberg's headquarters and gave him the message that no, the bridge was not in Folschemjäger hands. Wow, okay. That guy, uh, yeah, that guy will remember that trip for a, for a while to come, I'm guessing. Yeah. Stangenberg, now hearing this news, right, he, uh, he basically pieced together all the fragmented reports he'd heard from last night, and finally they had an idea of uh, some sort of dispositions and the objective which confirmed it was the bridge. He then prepped an assault force and got into trucks and drove down Highway 114. And they stopped a one and a half kilometers short and uh, 
began crawling forwards in their trucks very slowly with um, some disembarked infantry to um, guard them against assault or ambush. Now at this stage, the mortar fire controllers of the few mortars that had made it to the bridge for the British Airborne, and the artillery teams manning the six pounders, which we've already spoken about, and captured guns that they got off the Italians, had marked and recorded silently their, uh, the approaches that they believed the Germans were going to take. They could see them through the binoculars creeping forward, and they held their fire really, really wisely. Eventually, when they reached the ground of their own choosing, and they're pre-marked and recorded, the anti-tank guns opened up on the trucks and started to cause explosions and casualties. The Germans disembarked into the dead ground and started moving forward and, and reorging in the dead ground, uh, ready to assault. However, this is exactly now what the uh, parachute regiment's mortars have been waiting for, because they'd marked and recorded the dead ground. And they now started stonking the Germans in the dead ground and causing massive casualties. So Hultman Love that indirect fire. That's the one. Hauptmann Stangenberg could do nothing but be frustrated. In his impotent rage, he picked up his remaining men and they ran back down the road to the rear trucks that hadn't been destroyed, got back in them, and he roared back to Catania to his headquarters. When he got there in his rage, he uh, basically got permission from the divisional commander to take uh, Fassel's signals uh, battalion that was there and use them as infantrymen. He also went around the entire headquarters and gathered up chefs, clerks, administrative people, anybody that was in the division that he could find, gave them a weapon, loaded them on trucks, and took them back to the assault force. Typically, this is like a German response that they absolutely excelled at, which is cobbling together anything they could find to a camp group to uh, continue the assault. Now, what do you think about that? Suddenly you're a cook or a, a chef and you get handed a weapon and told you're at the vanguard of the assault, Rex. Yeah, I think that would be a bit of a shock. I mean, I guess these guys are trained to some degree, but um, they're definitely not uh, not A-grade forces guys that are uh, that are seasoned seasoned veterans that are used to being shot at, and know when to put their heads up, when to put their heads down. So even even getting them there, um, you're not necessarily going to uh, going to have a battle ready force, are you? Not at all. And again, we'll talk about how it relates to uh, bolt action later. But uh, you're absolutely right. Stangenberg, knowing this and knowing what he had, uh, had a few choices to make, so he quickly did some uh, quick battle orders when he got there. What he wanted Fassel's uh, experienced um, Falschemäger Signals Battalion, uh, who act as infantry, of course, and were seasoned veterans. He wanted them to go down uh, and outflank the right-hand flank of the British on the northern side of the bank. He himself was going to advance down the centre with his ad hoc units, um, which he'd armed, and keep them under control himself, and he kept himself a reserve of the most battle-hardened and trusted NCOs and officers that he could immediately behind them. So they advanced very, very, very slowly, and they got within 200 metres of the Paris position. Um, what happened then is Stangerberg started ever so slowly to stealthily approach again, but what they didn't realise is that they in fact hadn't infiltrated the perimeter, but the, uh, the men of the parachute regiment had been watching them and waiting them to conserve their ammunition. Eventually what happened was he came upon the five officers and 35 men that was all of the 3rd Parachute Battalion that had made it to the bridge. And these men now opened fire on him at extremely short range and caused massive casualties amongst the ad hoc battle group members. And they had to fall back. When he got back to a, uh, a basically reorg in some dead ground, uh, he was completely incensed. And, uh, and gathered his reinforcement group of uh, veteran NCOs and Falschemäger. He was betting on the fact that the paratroopers weren't expecting an immediate counterattack to happen. And he immediately launched it, and the um, veteran Falschemäger took over the assault from here, coming straight up the guts towards the Paris position and hit them full on. What do you think that battle was like? Yeah, so that's... Uh they're starting to get down to the to the nitty gritty of it now. You've got uh, guys on both sides, one side starting to uh, to realise well, the British are starting to realise that this is it now. This is the real thing, and um, and this is you know this is what we've trained for. And uh, the Falschemäger on the other side, frustrated, angry, um, 
and uh, you know wanting to get retribution, they're uh, they're out for blood. So that's going to be a that's going to be a tough fight for sure. Yeah, there was a Fulshmiaga called Herman Kuster, and he was part of that particular assault as one of the veteran men. So after the battle, he wrote a letter home and he highlighted the coast quarters uh, savagery of the fighting, and he said to his family this in the letter. British Fulshmiaga landed and we fought a battle to hold an important bridge across the Sumito River. They fought like tigers and eventually took it with terrible losses. The fighting was horrific, with men milling around and shooting and bayoneting each other. They were so close together. I have never seen men fight one another the way both sides did in the battle. So that is a veteran of the Russian front. Right. Okay. That adds that adds even more um, clout to what's already a pretty uh, a pretty serious kind of a description of what went on. So, yeah, yeah, no quarter. That's right. And the, uh, the the British Airborne had to basically behave like a collapsing bag defence um, as one of their positions is overwhelmed. They'd fall back to the next position. Um, units became intermingled and they fought like tigers with one another. It didn't matter so long as the man next to him had a maroon beret or had replaced that beret with a helmet for the fight. Um, one of the defenders was uh, George Pratt of One Para, and he said this, My brain gun hardly stopped firing the whole time. Then one of the lads next to me was shot in the face. His head literally exploded and sent bits of tissue and bone all over me. Like an automaton, he staggered backwards before colliding with the back wall of the bunker I was in. He slid down it, leaving a big blood smear where the back of his head had contacted the wall. Not five minutes later, the young lad who'd landed with me got killed. He was flung onto his back, having been shot in the chest, blood pouring out of the wound. How I didn't get killed, I don't know, as enough bullets were coming through the slit of the bunker to kill a dozen of us. Jerry was only 80 yards away by then. At the range, it was difficult not to hit someone, and I can honestly say I shot quite a few. But my ammo was my main worry, and I had to be very frugal when I fired to make it last. Wow, it's a really, uh, it's a really, I don't know, evocative description, isn't it? I mean, obviously the blood and the gore and that, but you can feel the, uh, the pressure and the stress and the, you know, the anxiety starting to build up in terms of, uh, you know, how it's how it's going to happen. The enemy's getting closer and closer. The guys beside me, left and right, are falling. I'm getting low on ammo. You can really sort of read between the lines and see the, uh, you know, the stress of the battle beginning to uh, beginning to show. I guess. Yep. Look, commanders knew the time was approaching to withdraw from the northern beachhead um, before the men or the ammunition they had was going to give out. But at uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon, they suddenly thought help was here, and a squadron of Spitfires appeared high overhead. Yellow smoke was immediately popped as per the orders to get their attention and the Spitfires came in and then they either didn't see it or they were preoccupied with some other mission. They clean flew straight overhead without firing any supporting sortie and disappeared over the horizon. Oh, no. So a lack oh. of air armoured support, the Germans are now using overwhelming firepower to crush the, Ger- uh, the British positions one after the other as they fell back. The final blow was that the uh, the Germans came in now with Panzerfausts, and they started using them against the entrenched positions, the the trenches, and also the uh, what pillboxes there were. So George Pratt, who we spoke about before, remembered the final blow was a shoulder-fired Panzerfaust. They began using them once they were within range, about 60 yards. First they took out the bunker on my left, and then it was my turn. So the trenches and two pillboxes lost in short time. And uh, George Pratt managed to get out just as his own bunker exploded. Right, so these must be uh, pretty new for uh, for the Germans at this point, Panzerfaust. Um, you sort of think of it more as a uh, as a late war type weapon, but um, clearly uh, clearly they're they're able to do some damage. I guess the shape charge thing probably helps with um, with bunkers as well as as it would for vehicles. I guess more so than a than just a normal HE type. Uh, type explosion wood? Yeah, very much so. And uh, in fact, when the, the Falschmeg used themselves against uh, even a mile in the low countries um, where they managed to penetrate massive amounts of concrete by using shape charges um, and basically breach the defences and take the you know the defenders completely by surprise. So, yep, that is literally what the Panzerfaust are being used for. Um, and you're, you're right. So with their loss of the northern pillboxes, the end's approaching for the northern bridgehead. 
The Germans are now fully encircling them, and they are sending out constant probing attacks, and the Paras are hemmed into a small patch of land at the entrance of the bridge. They are almost out of ammunition, taking casualties and against the enemy growing in numbers more and more all the time. As well as that, because the Germans now know what's going on, they've also called up uh, other things. They've brought up 88 um, guns into close support, and they're now using the 88s to fire directly at the pillboxes and the northern end of the bridge. Also, they've wow. pulled up uh, assault guns. They're reported as being Stugs or Stews, and there's not a definitive answer which one it is. Um, the Paras didn't care which one it was at that stage. All they cared is that they didn't get hit by it. That's some serious, uh, some serious uh, firepower. So I just looked it up uh, while you were chatting, and the maximum firing range of the uh, of the eighty eight nine point nine kilometers is how far they'll fire. Yep. So you got those up in close range and you're using them as a infantry anti infantry weapon basically. Um, that's some serious, serious firepower. Yep. They're firing them as close as uh six hundred meters at the British positions. Direct fire. Wow. Now, so with the arrival of the 88s and the German armour, um, basically Pearson, uh, as the brigade commander and holding the bridge, had to make an immediate change of mind. He decided that if he couldn't fully hold the bridge, he's going to at least cover his men to the south of the bridge and provide a blocking force and a bridgehead there that they could um, uh, basically contest the bridge and still hold and stop the Germans from getting across. So the men had fought all day long to hold that bridge. Now we're going to have to make a desperate life or death surge across it in the face of overwhelming fire. So he made a decision to pull his men back. The men at the end of the bridge, uh, as Pearson gave a rallying cry, and they decided then that they were going to make a charge at the end of the bridge. The first unit got up, or the first squad of men got up, and sprinted from one end of the bridge to the other and managed to make it across as their, their daring dash took the Falschmäger by surprise. Um, but I'm guessing like the uh, like the second wave of the uh, gliders coming in, then the Falschmäger knew what was going to happen and the length slot probably didn't go quite as well. The next lot started to take casualties and Pearson decided that uh, no more men could get withdrawn by this. So what he decided to do was give the order for the main to, to wade across the river and back to the southern bridgehead. So they started to organise themselves sort of basically a, a rough platoon sized group at a time uh, across the river by being carved by a rear guard on the, on the northern bank. And um, uh, the men from one para basically started to wade across. And um, they moved through the smite, the, you know, the smoke that was happening, the fires of the undergrowth, um, and and basically managed to make a lot of the men started to make it man, make it across. Luckily, so once the Paris had safely withdrawn the south of the bridge, um, they weren't actively pursued by the Falschmäger. When the Falschmäger finally appeared at the north end of the bridge and looked like preparing for a dash across the bridge, I met with volleys of rapid suppressing fire from the regrouped Paris, which had paid thoughts to, to charging across the bridge. So as quick as it got there and crossed over the powers and I straight back into new defence positions and ready to continue the fight. The cover on the south side of the river did not provide protection for enemy bullets and artillery. The men were trying to dig into fresh positions or increase the size of any sort of shell scrape or remaining trenches there were in order to get down and provide some protection against the uh, fire both indirect and direct that was coming towards them. Those men that were lucky enough to be occupying the German, uh, sorry, the Italian trenches that were well prepared earlier, um, were only taking casualties from airburst rounds. Uh, the two pillboxes themselves on the southern ends were covered in debris from the shelling. Telegraph poles jumbled, and splintered trees lay all around. And there was an Italian mule train of seven dead mules that added to the stench of the battlefield of the dead and the dying. And uh, that, the, uh, just this, the branch of the track running off to the west where it comes off Highway 114, was named uh, Dead Horse Corner. Of course, it was actually mules, but there were seven dead mules lying there. So Nice. It's, yeah. uh, it's a scene of bedlam, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think we might take a bit of a break there, Rex. What do you think? 
Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I think I need to go and pop a blood pressure tablet because um, it's uh, it's it's pretty stressful even now for me listening to this. Um, that's a joke, by the way. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's an incredible it's an incredible um, an incredible story, isn't it? It's an incredible story of you know success so far and then being pushed back and you know heroic dashes and now it's starting to build up and it's just um it's just the sort of thing that hollywood movies are uh, are really made of but um sounds good let's take a break and then we'll come back and uh we'll hear what happens next Mai a fare questa donna rosa, mi vottarà so picchia senza casa, io ci hai addirittura di cilla casa, se no schettava resta la. All right, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the Battle of Primasoli Bridge. Um, it's uh, it's tense. It's definitely tense. It's coming. It's coming down to the wire now. Um, we've got. Uh, we've had successes. We've had failures. Where are we at? That's right. So the uh, the British have um, the British Airborne have recrossed and regrouped on the southern end of the bridge. Um, and they've reorganised their defences there. The Falschmeg attempted to storm through over the bridge after them, and they were beaten back at short range by a massed rapid fire. Um, the Paris launched against them. So, it's now about 1,800 hours in the evening, and Stangerberg finally attempts to storm the bridge again, uh, but is repulsed by heavy fire from the, the British on the south bank. So following this, he gathers a signals battalion and he gives them their orders that across the Sumito River, 400 metres to the east of the bridge. To the east, that's the, that's the seaward side, right? Correct. Correct. Um, the battalion had already been trying to push through that area. I remember they were trying to flank the British on, that, uh, on the British right flank on that northern bank. So they're already in the area. So what he wants them to do now is to cross, wait across that river there. Uh, simple thing under uh, observation and enemy fire from the uh, southern bank. Yeah, and daylight still. Yeah. So the uh, Falschmjäger cautiously start edging forward in the reeds as a recce goes out and managed to cross undetected uh, by the enemy. So immediately they went back and passed the word back they'd found a, a crossing point and um, lead elements of the signals battalion of Fassel's uh, units started to cross. As the majority of them reached the other side, they uh, reorganised over there. They decided that they were, had been undetected by the British and they started to loop around to put pressure on the um, southern end of the bridge. However, they hadn't been undetected at all. The British paras, of course, constantly trying to save ammunition, were merely awaiting for them to break cover so they could uh, open fire on them. And as they opened up with a massive way to fire, the Falschmjäger signals started taking huge amount of casualties. They had to fall back to the dead ground, dragging their wounded with them. Into dead ground they went, beaten and bloody, and uh, found some dead ground to shelter there and amongst the reeds. At this stage, um, the amount of pressure that the British had been put under on the southern bank was immense. Brigadier Lathbury, now in charge of the, of the brigade again, realised that his ammunition was almost exhausted. The last Vickers, or the, the Vickers which they had, had, was down to its last belt of ammunition. They had no heavy ammunition left for any of their mortars, etc., etc. And the range was so short anyway, it would have been ineffective. So he made the very tough decision that that night they were going to fall back to the Johnny positions and continue to harass the bridge whenever they could, put pressure on them, and uh, try to prevent any destruction or harming of the bridge, and pray that the uh, 50th Division and the 4th Armoured Division, uh, sorry, 4th Armoured Brigade actually linked up with them as they were now overdue by about eight hours. So, uh, at 21.15, the withdrawal started. Little did they know that, that, in fact, the lead elements of the 4th Armoured Brigade had actually finally reached the edge of the battlefield merely a mile away and had stopped for the night. Uh, joined late of the 9th Battalion Durham Light Infantry around midnight. 
the Germans oh. become, were unaware of the British powers withdrawal because the uh, what MMGs they could scrape up, including uh, Italian pieces and the anti-tank guns fired the last of their ammunition to keep the um, enemy suppressed, but also to cause as much loud noise as possible to with cover the withdrawal of the uh, Paris back to the Johnny positions into safety. The uh, anti-tank guns even had their own hero moment as the six-pounder fired its last round that had landed on the bridge, fired its last bra- round, and the uh, gunner limbered up his jeep and drove away down Highway 114 South to safety. Um... The medical dressing station stayed exactly where it was at the base of the Johnny Feeps and continued to treat wounded on both sides. And they went through the unusual situation of being captured and uncaptured several times throughout the night as basically forces from each side pushed each other back and uh, walked into the medical dressing station and said, this is now under control of the Axis forces. And then a couple of hours later, the Brits would walk in and say, no, we have control of you again. The uh, surgeons were very uh, nonplussed and continued the operating on the wounded for both sides. Wow, that's that's uh, that's that's a lot happening, isn't it? That's a big day. Yeah, it's a big, big day. And uh, credit has to be given as well. One of the story which I which I didn't bring up is the medical officers themselves have done a fantastic job operating, of course, and even to actually set up. Um, one of the one of the captains, the RMO captains, had actually landed uh, after his parachute jump four miles away from the objective, gathered up his handcart by himself that had his medical supplies that by an absolute freak of chance had landed near him and on his way to his RV so he could find it, and pulled his medical cart for four miles back to his RV and set up the medical dressing station. Wow. And, that, you know, that's that's probably sounds interesting to us. But you've got to wonder how many guys' lives were actually saved because he had the he had the things that he needed to be able to do that. You know, how many how many actual people owe their lives to the fact that he just by chance found that, and then by sheer force of uh, force of will, stubbornness, um, decided to uh, drag it and not just abandon it and go, oh, it's too hard. I'm just going to walk and you know see what happens from there." Yeah. So at midnight. On the Johnny features, a Sicilian farmer approached the two para positions and told them there were tanks approaching from the south. On sending out a reconnaissance told to investigate, they came out of dead ground and saw the beautiful sight of a Sherman of the 4th Armoured Brigade and lead elements of reconnaissance of the Durham Light Infantry. The Durham Light Infantry told the airborne forces they had been given orders to hold up for the night uh, south of the bridge, and then attack at dawn with artillery support. However, as we know, Montgomery's orders were delivered directly to these units and explicitly were told to proceed at all speed to relieve the parachute brigade and seize the bridge. So time wasted by the 4th Brigade and the 50th Northumbrian uh, basically allowed the Germans to recite their weapons throughout that night, dig in, resupply and reinforce their positions with more reinforcements from Catania. Yeah, cuz uh they're they're only just a few kilometers away from their uh from their supply depot whereas uh whereas the British Paris you know it's a long way to Malta um or wherever you know wherever they were, wherever they got their uh their equipment from. Exactly. It could have even been even more disastrous for the whole allied campaign. Because as the, uh, the men of the airborne were standing there, they could actually use through their binos and, uh, and see the Germans stringing landmines across the, uh, the bridge in an attempt to blow it. Now what happened was a massive explosion happened when the smoke cleared, the, the British expected to see the bridge had fallen down. But in fact the bridge was so strong, all it had done was blow a single hole in the middle of the, uh, the road, in the middle of the bridge, and the bridge was still completely intact and crossable. Wow, that's a serious bridge. Yep. Now, at 0600 hours, uh, Brigadier Lathbury, being one of the last to leave the bridge, had finally arrived at two para positions. Around that time, the Durham Light Infantry began to relieve the parachute, paratroopers' positions and uh, 
and the airborne men sorted their weapons, tried to find some water and some food and medical attention. At around 8 o'clock in the morning, 9th Durham Light Infantry and 44 Royal Tank Regiment advanced against the Germans at the bridge area in an immediate frontal assault, and they were repulsed in a bloody battle by the Falschenjäger and their artillery and armoured support. So sadly, many minefields and the weapons turned and used to break up their assault had been uh, brought up and sighted during the night, the night of their own activity and uh, their own ability to lack a, the aggressive fighting spirit that there was required and their orders had been from Montgomery. The second attack on the bridge to retake it began with one para brigade again joining the attack. They were a bit unsatisfied with the fighting spirit of the uh, DLI. So they joined in the attack again. The first piece of ground which they liberated and recaptured was the, was the area of the medical dressing station. Again, it came under control of the British. Again, they pushed forward to the bridge. At the O group for that attack, the 8th Battalion of the Durham Light Infantry, which is a fresh unit, began to give their orders for their own attack. Brigadier Lathbury and Colonel Pearson had been invited, sorry, Colonel Pearson and Colonel Frost had been invited to sit in that O group and see if they could give any suggestions. And when the commanding officer finished a set of orders and asked how it was and what the men thought, what his officers thought of the plan, he turned to his guests. Colonel Pearson scoffed and looked him in the eye and said, that's fantastic if you want to lose another one of your, ba another one of your battalions. So red-faced, he turned to Colonel Pearson and said, what do you suggest? And Colonel Pearson took over the briefing and told him that he should try and flank the positions and that he knew a way to do it. So at one o'clock in the morning, the next morning, Colonel Pearson led the, uh, the men of the, of the uh, 9th, sorry, 8th Battalion Durham Light Infantry in a crossing of the Sumito River, 400 metres north, uh, northwest of the, uh, the bridge itself an attempt to flank the bridge defences and get in amongst the Falschmjager positions. As they silently crossed the river, they thought that everything had gone perfectly. Unfortunately, one of the Durham Light Infantry men uh, by Pearson um, had, had a negligent discharge and shot his, one of his own men in the head. Immediately fearing that they'd blown the cover of the whole attack, they waited for the massive weight of fire to be brought down upon them as their approach had been blown. But by an act of God or a miracle, it, uh, it just didn't happen. The Falschmjäger chose to ignore it and not investigate it. The attack went in and led to subs subsequent attacks and reinforcements by the uh, by 4th Armoured Brigade. And eventually the bridge was taken at great cost of uh, Allied lives. It turned into a case where if another unit supporting the airborne men had followed their instructions and had worked with uh, an aggressive spirit to get there, it would have saved many, many, many more lives before they retook the bridge. And that is the story of Primusol Bridge. And what a story it is too. What a story it is. So what were the lessons learned following Op Fustian and what were the lessons not learned? Well, if we look at casualties to start with, of the just under 300 men of the British Airborne that actually reached Primusol Bridge and its surrounding features, just over 50% of them were either killed or seriously wounded. On the German side, it's estimated there's 300 dead and 155 prisoners were taken. Sadly, for 156 Infantry Brigade, which is the units of the Durham Light Infantry that were relieving the British Airborne, Due to poor leadership and tactical decisions, in the three days after they took over from the British Airborne and they attacked the bridge, they advanced only 1,000 metres and suffered 500 casualties. The men of the British Airborne were withdrawn back to North Africa and then in the end to Britain itself to refit and prepare for the next operation, which for the 1st Airborne Division was Operation Market Garden at Arnhem. A year later, Apart from Pearson, every man who stood next to him at the bridge, at Primusol Bridge in the action, was either killed or taken prisoner. 
The Germans themselves, false Volsenjäger Division, continued to withdraw, fighting withdrawal back across Italy itself, and their next action was to be an illustrious one at the Battle of Monte Cassino. So Rex, that finishes the story of Opfustian and the Battle for Primasoli Bridge. Uh, how are you feeling after that? I'm really excited, to be honest. Um, it was uh, it was a great story. I think maybe I enjoyed it more than I've ever enjoyed reading a book or uh, or perhaps a movie as well because I didn't know how it was going to end and it was you know it was going one way and then the other way and then it was going back and oh how's it going to end um, and because I had no idea what the story was or how it was going to pan out um, it really had me really had me in the moment. <laughs> Good, good. I'm glad I, I might have some storytelling skills underneath it all. But uh, yeah, look, as, as part of um, my former regiment's history, uh, I, I know quite a bit about that, but I had still had to do a lot of research. Um, there's not a lot out there about this battle, and as a war gamer, it's, it's pretty much got it all for us for a scenario, hasn't it? It has. It's got, uh, you know, with the initial start, you know, you could think about how many you know, how many troops you actually, a variable number of troops that actually end up arriving on the ground. Um, what condition are they going to get, going to be in? They could be pinned when they arrive. Um, you know, how many troops, how many Falschermager are going to be there? You know, how many, how many of this, how many of that? And then, you know, the weapons, you're, you're down on weapons and then all of a sudden you find a cache of uh, indirect fire weapons. Um, so it's just, you know, it's just like a Hollywood movie. I think maybe it's the, as I mentioned before earlier in the podcast, it might be the, the British factor versus the American factor. You know, if that was, uh, if that was Patton, or if you know, if that was uh, D-Day or the 101st Airborne, um, you know, you'd you'd have ten movies made about it because, I guess, you know, the Hollywood thing, being in the U.S., um, but because it's a it's a British thing, um, you just you just don't seem to hear about it. But uh, yeah, what a great story. Yeah, and look, I think, echoing what you were saying, there, there's loads of potential in there for a scenario because the, the, it's primarily between, or the main part of the battle is primarily between two sets of elite troops who are both parachuted into the same landing zones, the same drop zones, um, to end up fighting each other. But prior to their arrival, there is, of course, inexperienced groups, um, 213 Coastal Division. Also, uh, as a battle goes on, what we find is that Stangenberg's ad hoc um, assault force he throws together with chefs and clerks and so on and so forth are also inexperienced or green. And I actually find that uh, in the bolt action context, it's particularly interesting because uh, in that I'm running for my army, uh, Falschmeg army, which is based around the Defense of Italy list, that I can actually choose green Falschmeg. So I have a small unit of green Falschmeg in my army because they represent um, the, one of these ad hoc units that have been thrown together. Um, and I'm really, really pleased with you know that little bit of flavour that brings to my army. As well as that, I've, I've thrown in a, a, an 88, and I've also stuck in um, a Stu, part of the, the Stug, sort of Sturmgeschutz family. And um, as no one sort of really confirmed which one it was there, that's also too authentic. So I'm, I'm really happy to be gaming you know, that force in a way that I think is, um, is quite authentic. And you know the uh, the bolt action, you know. So you have a, a bolt action game, you know, two platoons going at each other for whatever sort of a scenario, and you could tie that, um, you could tie that back to any back to any part of that. Um, but what I'd love to see is is a, is a book, and I think you should write it, Dan. But uh, a book where it's actually a campaign, because the game really, really lends itself. Or the sorry, the historical scenario really, really lends itself to actually being a campaign, doesn't it? And um, you know, how many, how many troops do you actually end up with um, by the time they they arrive? And then you know, how does it go against against the Italians? Um, and then you know, how does it go when the Falsche Magas start to move up from the rear and you're a smoke screen and there's a grass fire and you you know, don't have any indirect fire and you're outranged and, and then you find some find some weapons and then you get a, you know, do you get an artillery strike? Uh, not artillery, but a... Naval gunfire sport, yeah. Have you, are you rolling each turn and you've suddenly, you've suddenly um, managed to gain comms with the, uh, the Newfoundland off the coast for your artillery strike, exactly. That's right. And, you know, and does it happen the first turn 
when you know when you can start thinning them out, or does it happen right at the end when they're so close that maybe you might end up dropping dropping those um, those ordnance on your on your own guys for friendly fire? Um, so you know, there's just there's just so much in it, isn't it? Yeah, you, know, there you is. can just see you can just see those false mega coming up the coming up the valleys, coming up to those Johnny positions, um, and you can just just see yourself rolling to see whether your artillery is going to come in and moving that, you know, moving that marker at, at, at each turn for a failed roll. Um, and you can see it getting closer and closer to you. Yeah. And you're getting more and more worried as to whether, uh, you know, as to whether it's going to come in uh, at all or whether it's going to end up being friendly fire. And you've got all those guys up there in exposed positions digging out, um, digging out improvised foxholes with their, uh, you know, with their bare hands and trenching tools yep. in the rocky ground. Um, so yeah, yeah, very much so. I think the, as well as that, um, the bridge itself holds so many more possibilities in a lot of uh, actual historical bridge battles, because yes, the vehicles had to cross bridges, but the river could actually be waded in most places. So you suddenly open yourself up to a, a bridge, sort of, you know, one of these battlefields that can be easily recognised and enjoyed as as a real spectacle on the gaming table with beautiful terrain, but um, it's really able to be utilised. You can wade across the river, you know. You haven't limited yourself to a battle where, if you're lucky, your weapons might be able to shoot from one side to the other of the banks and in range. No, you can actually wade across it, you know. It'll be difficult ground, and, and you know, you'd probably have to build in something for do you had a, a deep part or something like that. But, you know, it opens up so many um, opportunities at that base level too for a, a, an open sort of a game. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all about the pimping your bolt action kind of thing as well. You know, for me, how many pin markers do you take by crossing the river? Yeah, is it, exactly. Is it D six? Is it D? Is it D three? Is it, you know, what is it? So, you know, these things, these things are affecting your troops. You know, the the ability to be able to get across a river is going to affect your troops' ability to be able to perform later. And and you know, you said that there was a smoke screen. Um, going on because of all the uh you know all the action and the fires around and what have you um so you know you're rolling for smoke and is that smoke still there do you get across the river under smoke or do you actually or does you know does the wind come up and so replayability wise i think if you were to make yourself a uh, fantastic table um you know even a permanent set table um replayability wise it's got endless scope because each one of those things is really uh, is really a dice roll, a literal dice roll, um, but uh, also a, a, a metaphorical dice roll. Where, you know, did that artillery come in? Did you get across? You know, did the 88 show up in time? Um, you know, how did that blockhouse go? Did it did it withstand the 88 or the um, or the Panzerfaust? Um, so all of those things are just uh, are just so critical to uh, success or failure. So I, I think you could play the game. I think you could play the scenario. Of games, um, or the, sorry, the campaign of multiple linked games over and over again, and end up with a different result every single time because the whole outcome of the of the operation was just uh, was just on a knife edge from the moment um, those planes started coming in close to Sicily. Quite right, and I think to use a a term that's uh, in vogue and but has also been long been before it was in vogue one of your favorite parts of wargaming uh, i don't think in this battle there's much need to introduce any artificial amounts of wargaming friction is there no <laughs> no no it's a high stress battle for sure <laughs> there's there's, uh, there's plenty of friction occurring uh, throughout every second So I hope you enjoyed that bit of history. I hope it's just inspired you to go and find out some more yourself, really. Um, we're not here for all the answers. We're just really trying to inspire. And if it's not this particular battle or campaign, that you go and find your own. Yeah, it's inspired me. I'm going to buy a whole new army for that. Oh, all right. Well, we better talk about where you're at with your existing one first. So where are you at against our checklist for our tournament preparation for Moab? Tournament. Yes, it's coming up fast. Um, so uh, a few things that I had of got on my list as the as the primary things one is getting my 
list completed so I can submit it for checking. Uh, so to that end I've been doing a little bit of play testing um, now that I've finally got things together. Uh, so nice. so it's, it's been good. I've been been playing and it's really refreshing my rules. Um, my rules as well. My uh, my Wargaming buddy and I have been playing um, everything weird that we normally skip over. So crazy stuff about buildings, um, artillery strikes, anything that we uh, that we sort of struggle with um, in terms of the rules, and we you know we just go oh that's too hard. Let's just agree to do this and move on. So so that's been good. That's been good. Good. Um, Good I've been painting. I've, uh, I believe that I've finished in the last two days all of my infantry painting. Um, so that was a big, big job. That's a huge achievement. That's a that's a milestone achievement in an army because get the infantry done is a real big thing. Yeah, and as you know from previous podcasts, um, I have been. Uh, I've got late war Fulcher Omega, um, so that's a splinter pattern camo. Oh. Um, so that's you know, it's really really time consuming and hard to hard to get right. Um, well, I find hard to get right anyway. Um, so I'm really happy with those guys. Um, and so now I've got, just got to get them all in one spot, um, count them up, work out if I've got enough to fulfill my list, which brings on the next thing. Uh, I've really got to final, finalize my list. I've, it's a 1,250-point event, and I've got about uh, 1,350 points in my list so far that I've just kind of thrown in there. Um, so obviously I've got to work out what to drop and what to leave in um, so that's proving a bit tricky but uh, hopefully I'll have that finalised in a week or so Good stuff I've also been painting uh, tanks, painting and assembling tanks I think I'm actually finally at the point where I don't need any more plastic glue for this army um, so uh, now it's just just about weathering the tanks and um, uh, fixing any, any uh, weird colourings that I've somehow ended up with, not quite sure what went on there but um, yeah, it's it's going well. So uh, so my my preparation is is going pretty well. So really, my big thing now is just to um, uh, is just to finalise that list and uh, and then just keep everything ticking along. So I'm pretty happy. Yeah, good stuff. I um I got a surprise. I so I'm 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 pretty good for Moab, but I've got a surprise. So I am not playing my beloved British. Airborne list. What? Truth, truth is, I uh, I thought that might be coming because um, you haven't been talking too much airborne lately, and all the photos I've been seeing uh, definitely no red berets. So tell me what you've got going on. Okay, well, uh, as you will have seen on the blog uh, on ValhallaGames.net. You would have seen um, some pictures of some terrain there. Um, the terrain, of course, uh, based around Primasoli Bridge and um, Sicilian Campaign. And uh, I have the British Airborne Army, so naturally I had to have um, some opponents for it. So uh, the second army which I've ever done is, uh, so if I can pull it out if a buddy comes around, is a Falschmjäger Army in Tropical um, Uniform. And very nice they are too. I'm loving that tropical uniform, and I'm loving the Perry miniatures as well. Um, they're, uh, they're they're very very nice. They're very nice, and combined with your terrain, um, those fantastic um, pantol roofed houses, and the uh, teddy bear fur, um, I'm I'm really impressed. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I encourage anyone to go and check it out, not through vanity, but to look at the the, the products. Um, anyone can do it. And, uh, and the quality of products is great, and we'll talk about that at another time, what it was, so we're not holding up the podcast here, but I'm really happy. But my army is, um, I'm really happy with how the army's coming along. Basically, I had to make a decision, um, and the decision was based around the fact that, hey, I've taken the British Airborne to one event already. Um, I'm really fortunate and consider myself lucky to walk away with um, you know, Best General for that. Uh, this one's testing some other toys uh, in this army list. So I've got a few different things to play around with. Um, the, the, the army works in a different way. And as well as that, being able to concentrate on it to have it ready for the tournament is also enabling me to have my army complete so that when I come over to you, Rex, we're actually playing a themed game based around the Battle of Premisoli Bridge. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, especially well now that we know all about it and um, we can check out whether... Uh whether our rerun uh, follows the same uh, the same historical 
outcome is what the uh, what the original one is, but also with that terrain. Oh my gosh, that's so nice that terrain you've done. I'm gonna have to up my game. I can see now. No more uh, plain green GW battle mats for me. I'll be having to uh, to get serious. Oh well, I think you know there's, there's always a place for those, which is you quickly deploy and you're quickly getting down for a really mobile table and throwing stuff out there. But yeah, I've I've invested some time in having a really. I've wanted it to be so that we can um, we can hopefully have a bit of a visual treat for for people who are looking at our blog and match it up and tie in everything we're doing our 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 blog, you know, um, any Facebook posts and and the and the podcasts that they go, this is the end outcome of stuff I've been listening and watching these guys do, and I just really wanted to have some terrain based around it themed. Yeah, it's totally altruistic. We don't even like bolt action. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, um, I'm really, I. but I, I can I just say that uh, your army is looking amazing, by the way, and you should be extremely, extremely proud of yourself. I actually feel guilty bringing over tropical uniform army and saying, here, can you play my one against against my paratroopers? Because, or vice versa, maybe you want to play British Airborne, but, but I'm actually feeling a bit guilty now because your army is lovely. I knew it would be, but it is. I just wanted to put that out there and say... Seems a shame, but uh, I think I think the theme is everything for us for these for these for this battle, isn't it? Yep, yep, and I'm looking forward to it too. But um, you know, the result of our of our hard, of our hard, absolutely altruistic labour that we haven't even enjoyed at all uh, has been. Uh, I've got uh, mate Nathan has uh, come on board for bold action, so well done, Nathan. So he's gone and bought a box set and he's building away. So that's uh, another another. Another bold action well buddy out there, and um, uh, there's another guy that's uh, looking like he might do it. Daryl, good on you, Daryl. Uh, he's talking about um, British commandos, um, so he's already found his uh, his list for that. So he's uh, that'll be that'll be nice to play. And uh, there's another guy as well. So the result of our um, of our labours are that more people are coming on board with the game, and uh, that's got to be a good thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And over the water here, I've got some friends interested in it that are starting to take it up too. So, um, yeah, building the community. And if and if we can have a theme battle where people can um, have us do some research for them, present a battle, then present some themed terrain, and then present some armies which look nice on that terrain, or we think they look nice on the terrain, it might be inspiring to people to go and do the same, and, and, and no doubt even better than us. And that's that's building our community. So Sounds good. I like it. And you know, there's some new uh, there's some new armies coming out too from Warlord. Um, been coming for a while. Been talking about it for a while, but uh, by the time you hear this podcast, they will have already dropped. But I, I am looking forward to uh, Desert Forces. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. And um, I think there's some other fantastic um, podcasts and stuff out there. And I think Warlord's doing a fantastic. Um, job of getting the information out to them and getting uh creating some 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 more interest with their their info online and their their newsletters they're sending out so i think the crescendo you know it's coming building to crescendo and uh, for me i'm looking forward to that crescendo being hopefully any time the next few days getting a courier box dropped on my doorstep where my ll main starter set's going to include all my goodies yeah, that'll be great. So L Alamein starter set. So that's uh, both sides, both opposing forces. Is that right? Yeah. So you, you get the um, the Eighth Army uh, box set, um, the new one. You also get the uh, the DAC box set, which I don't think is out yet until for a few weeks yet. Um, you get the you get the, the small rule book. You get you know a small amount of dice in there. You get a um, one of the new Sarissa. Um, African, ruined African buildings, which sort of quite urban sort of looking buildings rather than more of a rural sort of African building. That looks nice. Um, you know, some other stuff like templates and stuff like that. But it's a, and, the, and of course, the, um, the expansion itself, the, the campaign book, and a nice Rommel miniature. So, oh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. I haven't, uh, I haven't bought into it yet, but because um, I've just finished uh, buying everything on eBay that apparently is been ever put up there for bold action so um the uh the bank balance is looking a bit sad from that but uh once i've got over that uh i'm looking forward to uh to buying some uh 
some of the desert stuff and I'll be buying that from my local gaming guy um, just to support him um, and uh, but I'll be definitely buying the book from World of Games Direct so they get the get the limited edition uh, miniature of Rommel so that's a, that's a nice mini that one yeah good Good, yeah, no, it's um, it's really exciting, and I'm I'm loving that there is a real buzz in the air about this, um, even more so than the Market Garden book. Um, and I know in Australia and New Zealand, there's there's particularly a lot of excitement always about the desert and desert forces, and um, there's some contributors to the book in there as well from um, sort of in the community, the in the podcasting community and stuff too. So, um, yeah, it looks really exciting. Great stuff, and um, so you've been. If you're following the uh, the blog, you'll notice that I've built a table, sort of, uh, in my garage. So I actually, finally have a dedicated gaming table now, um, which I've never had before. I've been the the guy with the kitchen table that has to fight with the wife and the kids and the cat and everybody else to uh, to get in a game, which inevitably you never get finished. And then you know you've got miniatures strewn all over the table. Uh, for days and days until you can get back to it so no more of that for me I have a dedicated permanent table in the garage uh, on a little trolley that wheels around so I've got plenty of space around it when I need it um, so I'm uh, I'm fully set now looking forward to uh, to getting a bit more gaming done that was really inspirational. I was like, I was like, oh god, is this going to be a bit of a diversion from Rex getting his? How's he going to be against his checklist from episode two? And then, and then, lo and behold, that night it was like, uh, yeah, here's my entire gaming table set up. Here's my frame over top of it with like an anti-cat force field. Um, you know, the dome has been lowered over this part of the world. And uh, and by the way, I played like three games on it tonight. And I was just like, what the. Yep. What? Yeah, How it's. Did you get that done so it's fast? Uh, it's good when a plan comes together. A lot of times you try something and it's uh, this didn't quite work out how I'd planned, but uh, in this case it did. Yeah, as you, as you say, the big thing for me is because I share the cat with the garage. Sorry, the garage with the cat. Um, I needed to not have all the miniatures pushed off onto the floor by the evil beast. Um, so and also dust and you know just. Just generally keep it nice and tidy. Um, I made a like a, a lightweight cover thing with some of that some of that lightweight sign material um, and some little uh, little framing timbers and uh, put it all together in an afternoon. So now I've got a 30 second cover off and 30 second back cover on table. I did toy with the idea of having the winch to winch it up into the roof. If you go onto um, to YouTube and have a look at the guys, the train set guys. You know those guys, those guys are serious. They're um, they're long-term players, and um, they have a, you know some of them have a winch that um, winches it up so that it sort of um, like a, like a comes up in contact with a box type of thing, like a lid underneath, um, which still allows clearance for it and uh, keeps the dust and everything out as well. But uh, I decided that major. Um, major house surgery and buying a four-wheel drive winch and you know cutting out an eight by four section of the uh of the roof was probably a bit much for uh it probably was a diversion um so i'm glad i didn't go that way but i might still you never know yeah yeah can you will you just hit record on like a phone or something so i can hear the audio conversation between you and your good lady about cutting a hole in things so you can lift a winch a table up every night uh perhaps but i won't share it on the podcast <laughs> just so you know the yeah, thing is yeah. um the thing is the garage is my domain because i am a man so um you know I, I should be able to say what goes on in the garage and what doesn't right controversial whereas yeah. in the kitchen the kitchen table um that's a, that's another domain and uh, i don't have uh i don't have authority over that domain <laughs> yeah yeah ah uh, good on you Good on you. Well, that's um, that's our hobby wrap up, and we're we're feeling like we're in a good place. Um, really happy for you that you've broken the back of your hard work there, and I'm looking forward to coming over and visiting you uh, the, during the week before Moab, and then going to Moab. It's uh, I'm excited. I'm really excited. Sounds good. All right. Well, let's uh, let's wrap that up for now then, and um, we'll look forward to coming back in the next podcast. And I'm not sure whether it'll be pre or post Moab, but um, certainly we'll have some news. And I'm sure we will have uh, built something, painted something, and uh, played a few games of bold action. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have, yeah, 
bought, painted, played. We have stories of, of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> I will at least. All right, Dan. Well, I've got to go now because I've got something really important to do. Uh, I'm looking up on my shelf and I can see a box of plastic Folschemega and a box of British Airborne and I've got to cut, go and start clipping sprues. So uh, that's it for me tonight. And uh, I will look forward to, uh, to playing a game with you. And I'll look forward to, uh, to a next chat. And I'll look forward to an opportunity to, uh, to find out how everybody else's game goes uh, when they pay out the Battle of Prince Bridge. Me too. Thanks, everyone. Stay classy, Catania. All right. Good night, and Rex out. Come I have found a boost at on our rosa. Mi votara so fichia senza casa. Io c'ha ya rittura di cilla casa. Se no schettava resta la garusa. Fai la smurfiosa Io penso che con mia da mare da Per ora vai facendo a dispittura